Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. You are Lindsay. And Damn. you have a couple announcements, and then we're into today's show. I don't Correct? have a, I have, you have one, one you announcement. Have one. Even better. Even I better. I feel like you're putting the pressure on me. Do you want me to talk about something else? Nope. Okay, great. I don't want to. Uh, for the month of July, we have decided to donate to the Hill Country Humane Society located in rural Texas. They are serving a population of people who can hardly afford health care for themselves. So you can imagine how challenging it is for them to take care of their pets. Uh, the secretary of this foundation had reached out to me a while ago explaining the situation and that the Humane Society could help slow down the overpopulation of animals with spaying and neuter programs. But yeah. again, a, a largely uh, lower income community of people. Yeah. And so to help them, we are making a donation of $13,800 and they're going to use this money to help the continuation of building a mobile spay neuter clinic to help Great. pet owners, pet owners in this area care for their pets in a new way. And then uh, also we are putting $1,530 into the uh, scholarship fund for the 2024 folks. And when are we going to announce the recipient? Well, I have the recipients. I know who they are. We just okay. have to talk to them and see like, can we say your name on Got the it. show and all of that. So there's just been other things happening. Totally. Totally. But, but they've been notified. Okay. Okay. Great. And, th and then the book is for sale already, right? Yeah. Okay. So this book, this book, this episode <laughs> will air on 725. Uh, we're recording ahead of time. So it always throws like my yeah. timeline, but yeah. yeah uh, Annabelle's, you had your first chance at the book on this past Friday and uh, a, an autographed copy. And then this past Monday, everybody had access to both autographed and unautographed. And just again, we encourage you to pre-order the book because that's the only way we can guarantee A, that you'll get one and B, that you'll get it before Halloween. Because it is okay. just a limited number of books. Once they're gone, they're gone. And the pre-order kind of determines that. So go to badmagicmerch.com for that. Yeah. And you can get all the old volumes too. And how many fan submitted true horror stories do you have? 107. 107. Yeah. Are these going to be like little tiny, like couple sentences each? Exactly. Oh, you cool. Get it. Cool. We really kind of spread around all kinds yeah. of different vibes and stuff. Just like there was a shadow. Ooh, I was scared. Nice. Yeah. Nice. It's really going to get you. Oh, uh, so I woke up and there was like footsteps in the hallway and I fell back asleep. And then <laughs> go on to the next story. It's kind of like what happens to me. <laughs> um, this week, Dan, I have three stories. Yeah. Uh, my first tale is about the people in someone's bedroom. Okay. A little strange thing. And then my second story is about a possible attachment that has uh, very strong notes about suicide. So please take that into accommodation, uh, into consideration uh, if you're listening. And my third story, different thing that I don't know if we've discussed, energy vampires. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, whenever I think of an energy vampire now, I think of, um, oh my gosh, Logan probably knows the name. It's the, uh, the guys from Flight of the Concords, one of those guys. Oh, you're talking about Jermaine Clement. You're talking about the dude from uh, The Vampire in the Shadows. Yes, yes. What we do in the shadows. Oh, oh I love that show. <laughs> there's the psychic vampire I character. I forgot on that. about him. Ah, oh, it's so good. The bald guy. I'm yep. trying to remember his yep. name too. Yeah, and damn he it. he literally tries to bore you to death. He, he <laughs> sucks your energy out by just being painfully boring. Just this, a psychic vampire. This isn't quite that. I mean, okay. similar, but like not. Um, I have uh, my traditional two. I have a long one and a short one. The long story revolves around a social worker growing suspicious that something is really not right at the home of one of her clients. Oh, that's a fascinating idea. This is, yeah, this story creeps me out. And, and when she checks on the kids, the suspicion is very much confirmed. Okay. okay. Uh, for the next smaller story I have, I'll share some lore and a modern paranormal encounter out in the woods of Connecticut, the uh, supposedly haunted and abandoned Downs Road. So you want to see you're showing off your cozy socks and then we'll jump in. I like it. There's little slothies. I don't know if you guys know that I love a sloth and it's time to wine down. You get it. I, do, I get it. You get it. I get it. It just makes me think just a tiny little side note. Mm -hmm. Kyler had to get a mouse for his laptop and he was, uh, he needed a mouse pad. Do you remember what he got? 
<laughs> it's wine o'clock somewhere or something like that. It's wine o'clock somewhere. He he's like, yeah, you just consider me a middle aged woman. I think it's hilarious. I know. Ah, uh, I I can picture the store. I can picture being dragged into the store that sells things with those quotes on it by like my mom. I was I was just about to say, who's dragging you into those stores? Because it ain't me. But yeah, uh, not yet. Um, uh, I don't think so. I'm not a quote gal. All right. Uh, okay, you re- so we're jumping in here. The following story was posted by someone who claims, of course, that this is all true. Uh, the names were changed because certain details of the story were never made public by authorities, and it would be a huge and illegal breach of privacy. Privacy, Ooh, privacy, me, privacy for them as a social worker to uh, to share all the following with the names attached. Uh, much of this allegedly was kept out of the news at the time because of the ages of the victims. I would have been more hesitant to believe this story had it not been for all the gnarly potential topics I've considered covering on Time Suck, but <laughs> haven't, because despite how incredibly gruesome and horrific certain crimes have been, they don't get a lot of coverage for just, who knows, whatever reason. So perhaps this is one of those stories. Raina had seen a lot of shit during her 29 years of life. She'd grown up in the foster care system after her parents died and nobody was around to take her in. Or at least that was the official story. She found out later, much later, that her parents had attempted a bank robbery. Her dad had died, shot by police, and her mom was still in prison. What? When she was told her parents had died, it had been the 90s, when it was still considered more merciful for social workers to lie by omission to kids in the hopes that they would turn out, quote, normal, meaning they would go get a job, eventually support themselves, have families like everybody else. Get the fuck out of here. Therapy was also not a big focus at that time, nor was even really seriously checking in with the foster kids about their emotional well-being. Raina had seen firsthand that this approach had not worked out for many. She'd watched her foster siblings struggle with things like addiction, things that were probably at least somewhat hereditary, but they didn't have people looking out for them who knew what they were predisposed to and who were watching signs that they were in trouble, or four signs that they were in trouble, which made it worse. She'd watched girls in her high school get into abusive relationships because nobody had educated them on the signs of domestic violence, how it started off as small things, controlling who they saw, what they did, then escalated into all-out violence. Were it not for her last foster mom, Heather, she might have been one of those girls. Heather took one look at her and realized that Raina was smart, but wasn't applying herself. Though she was a single mom working hard to make ends meet as it was, she scraped up enough money for Raina to attend a good prep school with a college counselor who made sure that she stayed on track to graduate. When she did graduate, she knew exactly what she wanted to do. She wanted to become a social worker to be the kind of involved person who actually paid attention to what kids were going through and trying to get them into the proper program or therapy or whatever they needed to ensure their best chance at having a happy life. Not just a life where they could be considered conventionally successful. So that was what she did, graduating with her undergraduate degree in social work before going to work for social services and working part-time on her master's. Unlike her coworkers, Raina didn't have illusions about how hard it was going to be. She knew she would be stretched thin, overloaded with way too many cases, and too little time to see all of them through. But she would try. That was the promise she made to herself. If she ever saw that someone was truly in danger, she would do whatever she had to do, maybe even if it went against some of the guidelines of her job, to help them. And that was how she found herself standing in front of the McGovern's house for the third time that week. Here we go again, Raina muttered to herself when she shut her car door. What she saw in front of her was not inspiring. It was a small clapboard house and a row of similar clapboard houses, a familiar sight in the bad part of town where many of her cases lived. Except this house was worse off than the others around it. White paint peeled from the walls, the grass in front was a dingy brown, and the cement steps out front were cracked down the center, weeds sprouting from the gaps. The doorbell, she knew from experience, didn't work. Neither did most of the lights during the rare circumstances when Mrs. McGovern actually paid the light bill or Ms. McGovern, sorry, as she walked up the street, the humidity weighed on her skin, making her feel like she was slogging through a wall of water. Raina tried her best to tuck her hair behind her ears, wipe the sweat from her hairline, and smile before she reached up to knock on the door. Tap, tap, tap. Raina waited, holding her breath. A long moment passed before she heard a screen door inside swing open, and then Ms. McGovern's face appeared behind the door. Oh, she said, it's you. It's me, Raina said, offering what she hoped was a polite smile. It was hard to think that she had been assigned to Ms. McGovern's case for going on three years now. It began when one of her kid's teachers reported that she was coming to school in filthy clothes. Soon that teacher got wind of the kid's sibling's teacher who reported similar concerns, including the fact that both kids rarely seemed to have had anything to eat for breakfast, and the case was opened. Raina understood that being a parent was hard, especially a single parent. So in the beginning, she was empathetic 
She had made sure to sit down with Ms. McGovern and ask her about her life, hoping to get the full story. Over coffee in Raina's office, while the kids played in the playroom, Ms. McGovern told Raina about how she'd gotten pregnant at 16, then was kicked out of her house by her abusive father, and lived on the streets for a while. When she started seeing someone new, she would be all in, hoping to finally achieve some relationship stability, but the idyllic relationship would only last long enough for her to become pregnant. Then the guy would leave. That repeated three times, and then she caught a lucky break. One of Ms. McGovern's distant relatives died and left her a fully paid off house in her will. She moved there with her four children, but the house didn't fix all her problems, not even close. A series of break-ins hit the neighborhood, a vengeful ex came to stalk her, and Ms. McGovern got fired from her job. You've got to help me, she said, beginning to break down, her hands twisting in her lap. Please, for my kids. At the time, Raina had promised to do everything she could. She thought she'd gotten lucky with the rare case that really wasn't a matter of a parent being abusive or neglectful because they were mentally unwell, or let's call a spade a spade because they were a terrible person, but simply someone trying to do the right thing but hitting a series of rough patches. And Raina could help with that, could link her with programs that would lend her money for utilities, get her kids free lunches and more. For almost a year, things seemed to be going well. Ms. McGovern's kids showed up to school on time, dressed, and got school lunches free. But then, something changed. Time now for the tale of We Hear Them at Night. About a year after she'd met Ms. McGovern, Raina had been driving by the house by coincidence headed out to a dinner with her college roommates when she saw that the lights were off and it looked like nobody had been home in a while. That didn't make sense. Raina didn't remember Ms. McGovern ever having enough money for a vacation and her beat-up old car was in the driveway. Then when she returned the next day, the house was the same. The air around it seemed old and musty, the windows just a tinge darker than she remembered them being. She knocked and waited and knocked and waited. Eventually, a neighbor saw her sitting on the front steps and waved her over. You're not from the bank, are you? The neighbor was an older man with yellowed teeth and a fringe of stubby gray hair, but Raina could see a gleam of curiosity in his eyes when he looked over at the house. No, she said, shaking her head, I'm with social services. Have you seen Ms. McGovern or her children? He shrugged. I don't think so, he said. Raina frowned. What do you mean you don't think so? I mean, he trailed off as if he didn't know how to put it into words without sounding crazy. I, I hear them sometimes, but I never see them. I hear kids' voices at night, yelling, arguing, sometimes screaming. Sometimes it sounds like there are dozens of them there. He broke off, his eyes focusing on Raina again. But that's just kids, right? I mean, they're loud. But it doesn't seem like anyone's home, Raina said, unless Ms. McGovern left her kids there. No, the man said, I, I saw her too. I mean, never... He trailed off again. Never what? Never like in motion, if that makes sense. Sometimes I look out here and she's just standing at the mailbox. Or I see her standing at the window, looking out at the street. Or sometimes I'll see her looking out the back door at the backyard. My bedroom looks over it, he paused. Maybe she has a, what's it called when you can't leave your house? Agoraphobia? Maybe so, she said, though she was thinking the worst. Drugs. A shady boyfriend with shady friends, hiding out there if they committed some kind of crime. Young children around them, vulnerable. Raina for forced herself to take a deep breath. Thanks for your help, she said. No problem. The man replied. Also, if you see Ms. McGovern, don't tell her I said anything, all right? I hear her yelling at the kids sometimes, and I got a bad heart. Don't want to be on the other end of that. He chuckled weakly, she thought. Gotcha, she said, her blood running cold. The very next day, she returned, vowing to knock until somebody answered the door. She didn't have to wait long. It seemed like the moment her hand made contact with the door, it swung open. Ms. McGovern's scowling face peering down at her. What do you want? She asked after her initial unpleasant greeting. Raina had to keep herself from gasping. Ms. McGovern looked so much older. From her file, Raina knew that she was 37, but the woman in front of her had big purplish bruises under her eyes, wrinkles around her mouth and skin that seemed to sag loosely from her body, like toilet paper wrapped around a tree. N nothing Raina stammered, and then tried to collect herself. She had to keep from trying to look around Ms. McGovern to spot the children. That would only make her angrier. Ms. McGovern, it's been a minute. How are you? I'm fine, she thundered. What do you want? Well... Raina started, you missed our last couple of appointments, and I haven't seen you in the last couple of months. Well, Ms. McGovern threw back her curtain of greasy hair. It's not my fault you can't do your job. I've been here. Raina opened her mouth to say something. What could she say to that? But as soon as she did, Ms. McGovern slammed the door in her face. As she walked back to her car, Raina wondered about who to call. It was clear that something was happening, but what? Ms. McGovern had seemed angry, but not like she was on drugs. 
There was an intensely clear, lucid quality to her eyes, actually. It unnerved Reyna. Across the street, she sat in her car. This was the hardest part of the job, her mentor had once told her. Trying to make important decisions on limited information. One decision could split a family up indefinitely, plunging kids into a system they might not be safe in. Or you can make the opposite decision and leave them in a house that was much more dangerous than it would be to just remove... Wait, what the fuck was that? Raina's eyes swept to the second floor windows of Ms. McGovern's house. On one window, she saw two little shapes. Handprints, she realized. Small, like a little kid's. Was one of the McGovern kids trying to reach out to her? Slow down, Raina, she told herself. Kids stand at the window all the time. It didn't necessarily mean that they were crying out for help. As Raina watched, the handprints disappeared, like the body had been roughly jerked back. She stifled a gasp, waiting for the figure to reappear. Maybe the kid was playing around with her sibling. But they didn't. And then she thought she heard the faintest scream. Her heart now pounding, she drove away back to her office. She told her supervisor that someone, the police, needed to come over to the McGovern house. Something wasn't right. But her supervisor, a jaded woman named Mary, toughened by her years in the job, too many years perhaps, just gave her a grim smile. Tough day? Raina blinked. What? We all have them. Mary paused to take a sip out of her thermos of coffee. Listen, you should take the rest of the day off. Do something nice for yourself. Were you listening to me? Raina blurted and then felt incredibly stupid. Mary was her boss. She had to be professional. Composing herself, she said in her most controlled voice, I really think something bad is happening with the McGoverns. I think someone should go over there immediately. Mary hesitated and then seemed to give in, maybe just to get Raina off her back. What did the kids seem like? I, uh, Raina paused. I actually didn't see them. Did you hear them? No, Raina said, well, sort of. Maybe it was, I'm not sure. Raina, Mary said, the patience ebbing out of her voice. This is a hard job. We meet a lot of people in trouble, but you have to start thinking with your head and not with your heart. If we barge in there, we run the risk of opening up legal action against us, and we make it harder to come back when there might be a real problem. You remember that we're still trying to help find three children who've gone missing in the last couple of months, right? Raina nodded. She did remember them. Normally, CPS wasn't involved in kidnapping cases. They went straight to the cops. But some of them had had histories with CPS, and they were helping provide files. In other cases, it was suspected that a parent may have kidnapped their child during a custody dispute. It had taken up so much of their unit's time the last several months, and the children were still missing, meaning CPS was under increased scrutiny. So you understand that there are more serious things going on in this city than a lady with an annoying attitude. Mary's voice softened, and she added, It's not your fault. But these things, but these are things you'll learn at one point or another, and honestly, the sooner the better. But Raina started, though she didn't know how to explain to Mary what she saw. How could you describe the vibe of the house in a way that didn't seem completely ridiculous? How could you describe the rage in Ms. McGovern's face in a way that didn't seem cartoonish? Okay, she said. She did end up taking the rest of the day off, but not to go get a manicure or watch TV. Instead, she went to the reservoir, a little lakeside area she'd walked since she was a teenager when she needed to think. That day it was sunny, families out with their picnic blankets and kites. She watched the dad hoist his kid up on his shoulders, both of them smiling so widely that it hurt Raina to look at them. Why hadn't she had that? Why didn't the McGovern kids have that? Why did she and so many other people seem to almost always have to stand idly by while other kids suffered? No, she decided, stopping in her tracks. She was not going to let something terrible happen today. She was going to trust her gut. She had only been a social worker for a couple of years, but she knew what happened when people stood by and didn't take action. She'd seen the body bags come out of houses, body bags too small for an adult. That was how she found herself walking up to the McGovern's house on what felt like the hottest, most humid day of the summer. She also knew that she didn't fully explain why she was, she also knew that didn't fully explain why she was sweating through her clothes. She was scared. Her hand shook a little as she lifted it to knock on the door. Taking a deep, steadying breath, she gripped her tablet in one hand and planted her feet. A moment later, the screen door inside slammed and then the front door opened to crack. Ms. McGovern's pale blue eyes peered out. Yes? Hi, Ms. McGovern, Raina said, trying to sound both professional and cheerful. How are you doing today? How are the kids? I'm fine, she grumbled. Raina saw that she was wearing a dirty house coat and no shoes, her feet stained dark with mud. Kids are fine. You can go now. Wait, Raina stepped forward, putting her hand out so Ms. McGovern couldn't close the door. Ms. McGovern, I haven't seen the kids in months. I'll need to talk to them today as part of a routine visit, and I'll need to come inside. For a long moment, Ms. McGovern stared at her. Raina could smell her breath, eye-wateringly stale, like she hadn't brushed her teeth in months. 
Her eyes narrowed at Reyna, and Reyna prepared herself to have the door slammed in her face again. Fine. She backed away, letting the door fall open, and turned around, leaving Reyna to follow her. The screened-in porch was piled nearly ceiling high with stuff, most of it in boxes, leaving only a narrow path, and Reyna tried not to touch anything. Everything seemed to have a layer of grime on it, on which some of the kids had apparently written messages with their fingers. Scratched into one box was, David was here. Another said, poop, poop, poop. And then, slightly below it, in smaller letters, Raina could only barely make out, She is not my mom. Wait, what? Raina turned around, trying to make out the message, but in front of her, Ms. McGovern barked out, You coming or not? Raina had no choice but to follow her. Maybe, she told herself, that was simply a, a kid feeling angsty. She'd written that she'd hated her foster parents once in Sharpie in her closet. It was sort of the same thing, right? But her gut told her it wasn't. Crossing the threshold, Raina had to hold her breath. The air was so stale, like the windows hadn't been opened in months, with a slight chemical smell that couldn't have been some kind of cleaner. It smelled too potent, too toxic. Dust particles swirled in the weak light, which illuminated the hallway. To their left was the kitchen, the sink overloaded with filthy plates, empty boxes of cereal and wrappers littering the kitchen table. To her right was the living room, the curtains drawn over the windows, the couch looking lumpy and deformed. So, Ms. McGovern said, standing in the middle of the hall in front of the staircase that led to the second floor, what do you want to ask me? Rain had come with a checklist on her tablet. Everything that she wanted to get from Ms. McGovern and everything she would need to tell her supervisor to get someone higher up involved. But the message on the grimy box had unnerved her and all of her preparation had gone straight out the window. Maybe I should talk to the kids first, Raina said, trying to sound gentle but firm. Then we can just go over the basics and figure out a time for our next meeting. Suit yourself, Ms. McGovern said, jammed a thumb in the direction of the stairs, or jamming a thumb in the direction of the stairs. They're upstairs. Raina nodded and then paused. For some reason, she didn't particularly want to turn her back on Ms. McGovern. And then she didn't have to. After a long, tense pause, Ms. McGovern lumbered over to the kitchen and Raina began making her way up the stairs. At the top of the stairs, she heard something, a long creaking sound, but it wasn't coming from upstairs, it was coming from the kitchen. Slowly, trying her best not to let the stairs creak under her footsteps, she crept back downstairs and peered around the corner into the kitchen. Ms. McGovern was gone, but a door she had never noticed before on the other side of the room was open. A cellar door? Why had Ms. McGovern gone down to the cellar? Raina shook her head. She had a limited amount of time before Ms. McGovern might change her mind, force her out. Raina really didn't want it to come to that, so she had to get upstairs quickly to talk to the kids and figure out what was really going on. She crept back up the stairs again. It was only then that she realized all of the sounds that should have been associated with a house full of children, laughter, playing, and, well, screaming, were noticeably absent. It was silent. She moved down the hall to the bedroom next to the bathroom and knocked on the door. Hello? Anyone in there? No answer. Raina knocked again. I don't know if you remember me. I'm Raina. I just wanted to ask you some questions about your mom. No answer. But she thought she heard a vague scuttling sound, something scooting across the floor. I'm going to come in, okay? Raina pushed open the bedroom door. It opened easily. When she looked down, she saw that someone had taken off the doorknob and the lock. Then she looked up. Sitting in the center of the room, facing away from her, was a small figure in dingy blue jeans and a faded gray hoodie. She caught the barest glimpse of curly brown hair coming out from the hoodie. This was David, Ms. McGovern's oldest kid. He was nine. Hey, David, Raina said. Are you okay? Yeah, David said in a flat voice. Just bored. Summer sucks. Raina looked around the room for a place to sit, but there wasn't one. There wasn't a desk or chair, just a couple of mattresses on the floor. One of them didn't have any sheets on it. Gingerly, she took a seat on the mattress closest to David. He was still half turned away from her, his face obscured by his hood. Why does summer suck? I'm just bored around the house, David said in that same monotone. We never do anything. We never go anywhere. From their talks before, Raina remembered that David was an artistic kid, always drawing. He'd asked her for her pen once, and she'd uh, never asked for it back. Maybe I could bring you some art supplies sometime, she offered. Would you like that? I don't know, David said. I guess so. It was becoming clear that Raina wasn't going to get anything out of him. He answered her questions in short, flat sentences. His face still turned away from her. Was he drugged? Raina couldn't tell. She wished she could just take him, grab him, put him in her car, but that was only going to create more problems. I'm going to go talk to your sisters, okay? Raina said. You can come get me if you think of anything else. 
You want to talk about? I'll just be down the hall. David made a non-committal noise as Raina stood up. At the door, she thought she heard shuffling behind her and turned around. David was standing up, his eyes on her, and for a brief moment, she caught a glimpse of his face. Downcast brown eyes and curly hair hanging limply from his head, and then he turned away again. Raina left the room and stopped in front of the next door, hoping that this interaction would be better than the one before it. Maybe, as much as it pained her, she needed the advantage of surprise. So instead of knocking, she simply pushed open the door. Inside, two small figures snapped their heads up, then dropped them down, facing away from her. Both were wearing baggy clothes, like David, and had on beanies, even though it was the middle of the summer. The smaller of the two started to cry, and then the larger turned and wrapped her arms around her shoulders. It's not mommy, she whispered. It's someone else. Raina's heart sank to her stomach. She had still held on to hope that it was a straightforward neglect case, but the crying said something else. It reeked of abuse. Hey, girls, she said. This would be Allison, seven, and Isabel, six. I don't know if you remember me. I'm Raina. Can I ask you some questions? Go away, Allison said. We don't want to talk to you. She huddled protectively around Isabel, shielding her from view. It's okay, Raina said. I'm a safe adult. Is something or someone around here not safe? At that, Isabel started to cry. Raina felt her pulse jump. She didn't want Ms. McGovern to hear and come upstairs. How well did sound travel to the cellar? It's okay, she repeated, starting to walk towards them. She put her hand on Allison's shoulder. Allison, it's okay. No, Allison shouted, worming away from her, and Isabel cried louder, pulling the beanie down over her face so it rode up in the back. That was when Raina saw it. On the nape of Isabel's neck, there wasn't any hair. There were little raw cuts where a razor had scraped the skin, and then a curl of hair falling out of the back of the hat. But something was wrong with it. It wasn't sitting on her scalp the right way. Raina gasped. The hair looked glued on. <gasps> That was when she remembered David didn't have brown eyes. He had green eyes. These weren't Ms. McGovern's children. She is not my mom. Allison, Isabel, she started praying that Ms. McGovern would hear Isabel's wailing. I know those aren't your names, okay? I know you're not her kids. We need to get you out of here, all right? Raina felt for her phone in her pocket. Nothing. In her distracted, concerned state, she had left it in the car. God damn it. Please, stop crying, Raina pleaded, sinking to her knees. When Isabel, or the girl who she thought was Isabel, turned around, Raina could see that she bore no resemblance to Ms. McGovern. Her skin was lighter and almost translucent white, and she had a smattering of freckles. The hair that was growing fuzzily on her scalp was a bright copper color. I need you to stop crying, okay? We need to get you out of here. The younger girl sniffled and the older girl shook her head. We can't get out of here, she said. She'll just take us to the basement. If we're not good, we have to stay there forever. Raina's heart sank to her stomach. Was that what had happened to Ms. McGovern's actual children? A voice spoke from the doorway, startling her. We hear them at night, David said. He dropped his hoodie, and Raina saw that his scalp was also covered in small cuts. His real hair was black and stubbly, two curls glued on in a messy, uneven way. They bang, ag they bang against the door, and she yells at them to shut up, but they don't stop. He paused, frowning. How could they keep yelling for months without any food or water down there? Raina was speechless. She felt sick. She now thought about the pair of disembodied hands she'd seen pressed against the window, about Ms. McGovern's haggard, sleepless face, her muddied feet. We all have to get out of here, Raina said. Run now. The kids took off down the hall, David in front, followed by Allison. Raina scooped Isabel into her arms, but she still needed to find the last child, three-year-old Carly, or whoever had taken Carly's place. Charging down the stairs, she shooed the three children outside and gave her car keys to them. Go get in my car, the red one right there, across the street. Use the phone in the cup holder, in between the front seats to call the police. Just push 911 and then the green button. David nodded, taking off, the girls following behind. Raina steeled herself and turned back to the house, even though every part of her body was telling her to turn around and go. She was so scared, but she couldn't go. Not when another child's life still depended on her. As she neared the kitchen, she heard yelling coming from downstairs. Stop it! Stop it! Ms. McGovern's voice screaming over a child's crying. Stop it, damn you! When she made it to the top of the cellar stairs, she noticed the shadows on the walls. There was one big one in the center, a hulking figure, Ms. McGovern. But it was surrounded by smaller shadows. Four of them. The figures of small children that seemed to dance around her as though to taunt her. Stop it! Stop it! Raina realized that Ms. McGovern wasn't talking to Carly. She was talking to the shadows. Stealing herself, Raina charged down the stairs. In the cellar, she saw Ms. McGovern in the center of the room, but there were no corresponding bodies to match all the shadows. They had disappeared. In a corner sat Carly, or Carly's replacement, crying, her face streaked with tears and dirt. In the center of the room were three squares of dirt. A fourth grave was dug out. Stop it, Ms. McGovern said again, 
She didn't notice Raina and tried to pick up a shovel leaning against the wall, but it flew out of her hand and across the room. Wind whipped around, scattering the dirt, blowing into Ms. McGovern's face. Listen to your mother, brats! Ms. McGovern! Raina shouted. Step away from Carly! Step away from the shovel now! Slowly, Ms. McGovern turned to her, but her eyes were vague, like she didn't know if Raina was truly there. They wouldn't listen to me, she muttered. I'm the mother. They would. They have to listen to me. But they're going to tell, and they couldn't tell. I'd go to jail. She was breathing hard now, panting, her words coming out in hoarse gasps. Who would send their own mother to jail? You're not their mother, Raina said. Those aren't your kids, Ms. McGovern. Something changed in Ms. McGovern's eyes now, like she was truly seeing Raina. You are going to take them away from me, she said, stepping forward. You are going to take my kids. If you can take kids, why can't I? Why do you get to decide who has a family? Why do you? Clang! As Raina watched, the shovel sailed into Miss McGovern's side, knocking the wind out of her. Raina thought she saw a shadow on the opposite wall, a taller one, about David's height. Then it flitted away and Miss McGovern was getting up slowly, grunting in pain. There was an open gash on her forehead, where the shovel had hit her and she groped around for the wall, trying to hoist herself up. The shovel, Raina thought she heard a voice whisper. It was only a few inches away from her. She reached for it, half expecting to fly out of her hands, but when she grabbed onto it, she heard the same voice. Now, it's the only way. With a roar, Ms. McGovern charged for her, her hands reaching for Raina's throat. Raising the shovel over her head, Raina brought it down hard in the direction of Ms. McGovern's head. The weeks that followed were a blur. Slowly, the police managed to put together the story of what had happened. From the decomposition of the bodies buried <gasps> in the basement, it was determined that Isabel had died first. The cause of her death was determined to be natural, but some officers suspected that it was from an untreated illness, something that could have been treated at a hospital. The estimated date of her death was eight months earlier, around the time a little girl named Leela Cooper went missing. She had been snatched from her school's playground, gone before anyone knew what had happened. It seemed like the two older kids eventually realized what their mother had done. They didn't buy her story, that their sister had gone to stay with relatives, relatives they'd never met, and that a cousin had come to stay with them. They realized what was happening when, months later, Raina started showing up again, and their mother started gluing Isabel's hair to Leela's head to hide what she'd done. Soon after, Ms. McGovern killed the two older kids, replacing them with kidnapped kids. She told those kids, their names were Peter and Shannon, that their parents had been found unfit and that she was their foster mom now. By the time they realized what was truly happening, they had seen the basement. They knew what happened to kids who disobeyed Ms. McGovern, and they wanted to keep Carly, the only kid who hadn't been replaced yet, safe. Still, Peter wrote a note on the grimy boxes on the porch, and it was this note that led Raina to them that led Raina to the basement, where Ms. McGovern attacked her and Raina smashed her in the head with the shovel. At least that was the official story. Nobody paid much attention to the parts of the story when the kidnapped kids told police officers about the strange shadows that moved around the house at night, about how they heard Ms. McGovern screaming at the shadows just to let her get some sleep. And nobody paid attention to what Ms. McGovern, who was now in a mental facility awaiting trial, was saying, that if only Isabel had stayed in the ground, then none of this would have happened how she could still see the shadows in the corner of her vision at night. And Raina didn't tell anyone about what she'd seen in the cellar. She still didn't know if she believed it herself. Both she and the kidnapped kids had been diagnosed with PTSD, which brought with it a whole nest of messy psychological complications. Maybe she had hallucinated the whole thing. Maybe sometimes it was just too hard to make sense of how a parent could hurt their own child. She was put on paperwork duty indefinitely, and a year later, quit her job. She decided to go back to get her master's in psychology and become a psychologist working at various schools across the country. She still kept up with the kids occasionally. Peter texted her updates on his life, like he'd gone to camp or made the soccer team. Shannon's family had decided to move to a different part of the country to start over, and Leela's family had done the same. Little Carly was adopted by two women in the community who had been turned down for, conven for conventional adoption for years. Almost everyone put the events of those years behind them. Raina tried to. But sometimes, despite her best efforts, she still couldn't sleep. The image of Ms. McGovern charging at her still replayed in her mind. On those nights, she'd get in her car and drive over to her old house. It had been bought by a real estate company and was scheduled to be torn down in the next year. She would sit in her car for a couple of minutes, acknowledging just to herself that something strange had happened there, something that would never be reported in the newspaper, but she knew it had happened, that it counted for something. Then she would drive away the house becoming smaller and smaller in her rearview mirror, the windows shrinking to tiny boxes, and sometimes she swore she saw a hand parting the curtain and waving goodbye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot to not like about that story. Yeah, intense. Ay, ay, ay. It's always so hard when 
well, when kids are involved. Yeah. And then when like true crime and the paranormal. I know, and the intersect. Mix. Yeah, because it's like, what what came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, it's like, was Miss McGovern? Yeah. You know, she had a terrible upbringing. So true. she was already, already working at a deficit. Right. And then was there a result of mental illness because of her upbringing? Probably. Yeah. And then, you know, never learned healthy relationships, like all these different yeah. things. So then she has kids of her own and it's like, is it the mental illness? Does the mental illness take over? Did she start using drugs again and then murder her child? Kill or, or yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and then the paranormal kicked in? Or like was the paranormal already existent in She's the house? Kind of pushing on her. Yeah. And we talk a lot, uh, talk mm -hmm. about that a lot here where it seems like the evil forces of the supernatural, because it does it doesn't all have to be bad. Oh, yeah, totally. Right? Yeah, but we just, that's the ones we share here yeah, <laughs> for the like most part. The, the dark yeah. parts of it seem to really prey on people at their weakest, most vulnerable time. So yeah. if you are someone who is struggling with your mental health and then you're living in a situation like a haunted house, like how do those two things intersect and how does that make exacerbate yeah. existing problems? Mm -hmm. Man. Yeah, this, yeah, this story messed with me. It, it, it just, it just, I don't know. It just felt so, I don't know, so real. Yeah, it's, it's, as crazy as it was, and I'm like, man, what a terrible thing. Made me think about like going to houses like that. Like, ee. yeah, one of my best friends, you know, one of our friends is back in school to become a social worker oh, and yeah. get her a master's degree, and uh, you know, she just wants to help, but she's a lot like me, and she's a bleeding heart. And I've talked Ooh. to her so many times. I'm like, I. I commend you. I do. Yeah. But I need you to think about your mental health. Yeah, like, you got to steal is, yourself. I, I couldn't do it. We would have a house full of kids that were not ours. We would have absolutely no money because I would yeah. just be like, I would give every last penny we had to save the life of a child to like try and give them a better shot. Yeah, I believe that. Oof. Uh, no pics associated with this story, but- Thank uh, God, honestly. Uh, after hearing this, some this is just some stock photo of a kid with their hands on the glass. It just reminded me yeah. of like what she saw. Yeah, it is always so creepy. Oof. And then uh, this next bit has nothing to do with the story. I fell into a web hole okay. where I couldn't stop looking at different AI-generated horror pics. Oh, boy. Uh, this next one's from the Met wow. Gala. Terrifying. Oh, the Met Gala? Yeah, they, they just took, the AI was like added horror to like real photos from the Met Gala or Gala. And that one, especially when I first saw it really big, it just creeps me out. All the mouths in her rib cage. I'm trying to figure out who that actually was to begin with, because the whole thing about the Met Gala is that it has a theme, and it's usually like based on a designer. There's been a lot of controversy about it over the last couple of years because of Karl Lagerfeld, mm. and like he's not a good was not a good guy. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure out like what celebrity that was. I don't they, know. Like but that's some nightmare fuel for me. Yeah, it doesn't freak me out. <laughs> I'm like. Oh, I have more questions. <laughs> how, did, how did AI generate that? What did they I plug know. in? What was it? Was it like exposed rib cage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other picks? Uh, nope, just those two. Any questions on that one or do you want to move away from it? Uh, no questions. Just like one like side note. Yeah. Very early on when you were talking about uh, Mrs. McGovern. Oh, yeah, Ms. No, McGovern. No, 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 no. Raina. Raina, yeah. And, or maybe it was Ms. McGovern. Raina's know. the social worker. Ms. I, McGovern. No, I know yeah. who's who, but I can't remember who it was that like never learned proper, healthy relationships. I think it was Miss McGovern. Oh, uh, actually, that was Raina was just talking about like her siblings growing up in the foster care system, uh, system, how some of them never learned that kind of stuff. Yeah, and it just, I made a note, and this is like, would obviously be only for people who are in the Coeur area, but Safe Passage, mm -hmm. the, um, a shelter, and a, like they do a variety of things in the community for domestic violence. Uh, if there's a concern of abuse, uh, especially sexual abuse in a home, yeah. uh, they... They offer a variety of services, but on the not so sad side of things, one thing that I think is so cool that they do is they go to the local high schools, uh, two of them, and they offer a program where they teach kids about those early signs of oh. possessive, jealous partners. So Smart. it's like, you know, I think that one thing that often gets overlooked with our teenagers or our young people when they're dating is mm -hmm. when they have a significant other that's like, well, what are you doing? And there is like a normal level of yeah. like, hey, what are you up to today? But then there's that level of like, you shouldn't be there. Tell me what time you get there. Like these, these steps that happen that are control and are mental, emotional abuse and often lead to something bigger. And as parents, I think sometimes we miss it where we're like, okay, tell your other person to calm down, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. but take it seriously when your kids are talking about it, because that is that this can be their first example of a relationship outside of what they see in their home or what they know to be healthy or what they've been taught is healthy. And it can 
Yeah. You know, it can lead to a lot of things. And I just think it's so cool. I'm sure there are other programs across the country that do this, but it is something that I've always felt so passionate about where it's yeah. like, that would be so helpful. You would avoid totally. a lot of things in your life if somebody somewhere was telling you like, yep. that's not okay for somebody to text you 42 times while you're watching a movie with your friends. That's not okay. I don't, I don't want to bog down like this with like non-horror stuff. So I'll just gloss over this fast. But we were just talking on this, uh, the secret suck we just recorded. Yeah. Which is be several weeks ago now by the time this comes out. Oh, sure. And we were just talking about, or I was mostly going off uh, a lot about how I just wish more things, so many more things were taught in schools. Like here's what uh, this religion's about. Here's what that religion's about. Yeah. Here's what this um, uh, gender is about. Here's what that's about. Like, like knowledge is power. Yes. And when you're just exposed, here's what a good relationship is. Here's what a bad relationship is. Because a lot of kids just won't get that at home because their mm -hmm. parents are afraid to have those talks and then they're so unprepared yeah. when those things in life hit them yeah and that's when things get really bad oftentimes mm -hmm. when you just you don't know and your ignorance leads you into a terrible place and you're like if just if someone would have told me yeah yeah well and a lot of times the parents they themselves haven't had healthy relationships yeah or you've got like i just i don't know that story just like hit me in so many ways like i was raised by a single mom for all intents and purposes and she hadn't been shown healthy relationships in her life yeah and it took her a long time many, 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 many moons later to yeah. find a healthy relationship. And she still has her her bumps and her bruises yeah. and doesn't, we don't all have it figured out. So it's just like, sometimes it's through no fault of their own that these kids, mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't even mean that they're being abused at home. It just means like, maybe your parents just don't know better. Yep. yep. And then you don't know how to find the resources. And I'm like, you can only get so much off the internet. Yeah. Like you need somebody to talk to you. Okay, you ready for the next story? Oh uh, yeah, that was heavy. A little bit of spooky lore on this next one before I share a quick little modern encounter story. Downs Road has been closed for many years now. No one seems to know exactly why. The narrow road, uh, only about 10 miles long, originally connected the quaint little towns of Woodbridge, Bethany, and Hamden, Connecticut, before it was discontinued and left to the eerie, dense woodland surrounding it. This short stretch of road has had a multitude of reports of paranormal activity linked to it, and most local residents wouldn't even dream of walking down it now at night unless it was for some reason absolutely necessary to do so. The abandoned road is completely unlit, a few crumbling structures are scattered along its sides, and the whole vibe is pretty dark and oppressive. The road has been described by some as a vortex site, due to the immense numbers of various encounters. Many people have claimed the feeling of being watched whenever they venture out there, accompanied by an unusually intense feeling of fear, often making them feel the need to run as fast as possible to get away from the road. Paranormal activity is prevalent all along the road, but especially so near the end, in the woods near Hamden. Sightings range from ghosts, often interpreted as being the spirits of farmers or Native Americans who once lived there, to UFOs, or an area cryptid. Between 1954 to 2011, at least 17 UFO sightings were reported in the area, seven on the road itself. Reports range from strange orb-like lights to seeing full spacecrafts coming down over the West River that runs alongside a portion of the road. And now a word about that area cryptid. There have been countless reports of sightings of the so-called Downs Road Monster, said to be a four or five foot version of some type of Sasquatch or Skinwalker. Reports of this creature go back for centuries. The first colonial settlers hundreds of years ago would tell stories of a devilish creature lurking out in the woods. As far back as the 1600s, settlers told stories about uh, a creature with glowing eyes and blood curdling screams that came from the creature from the woods, local tribes, had been telling similar stories for an unknown number of years previously. Here's one of the many strange claims that have come from this area in recent years. Time now for the tale of Downs Road. I grew up a few towns away and had always heard of Downs Road being this cool, creepy haunted place. Two of my friends and I decided to go check it out. This was pre-smartphone era, the 90s. <laughs> Instead of Google or Apple Maps, we took an actual map of Hamden with us. While looking at it, I found a shortcut to Downs Road from where we decided to park our car and walk. As we hiked in and got close, we made it to a heavily wooded area where the road almost looked like it had been carved out of the trees before turning into dirt. That's when the noises started. It sounded like people talking way off in the distance, but above us. Like a bunch of people up in the trees. So creepy. And then we saw what I can only describe as a ghost. It was just past sunset and it was barely starting to get dark. And in the fading light, we all clearly saw an orb floating out from the trees and onto the road ahead of us. And then the orb materialized into a figure of a man in a suit. You can see every detail, the cut of the suit, his hat, a very stern expression on his face. We all froze. And when I turned to ask my friend if he was seeing what I was seeing, I saw that all the color had left his face. The ghost looked more alive than he did. I thought he was gonna pass out. 
The man we all saw turned to walk across the road, started to do that, and then transformed back into that orb. And the orb floated into the trees and vanished. We turned around and headed back to the car. While the man had disappeared, a man we all saw, we all agreed that we still felt like he was near us, watching us. We never saw him again, but before we left the road for good to head through the trees to our car, we started to hear footsteps. They were picking up in their pace, like someone going from walking to running. And that's when I lost it. I started screaming. Everyone else started screaming too, and we all sprinted through the woods without ever stopping to look back and see who or what was chasing us. By the time we made it back to the car, the footsteps had stopped, and we hopped in and left that area as fast as possible. Never saw any aliens or any cryptid, but we definitely saw a ghost. And we were chased by something on Down's Road. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Just a little quick uh, experience. Okay. Oh, it's creepy. And I, and I have a few little pics. Uh, this first one is a picture of the a little stretch of Down's Road. There's more pics like this at AbandonedCT.com. Oh. Uh, this next one comes from that same website. This is the remains of some structure that once stood along this uh, now unused road. Meh. And then uh, from Damned. Connecticut.com, a portion of the road covered in snow. Oh, man. And then finally, I don't know what the hell this is. I kept trying to find a picture of something spooky or creepy spotted along down the oh, road. Oh, God. Right? Uh, somehow that search led me to this photo. The photographer or subject not credited, it was one of 17 photos in a list of old creepy Halloween costumes in a Yahoo.com article. It feels like it's supposed to be like a, a mental patient. Or mummy combined. Yeah, it's... I don't know, but that is effed up. <laughs> it's very uncanny valley in the face. Well, I, that's because there's a real person in there. Right. If it's a costume. So how is it uncanny valley? when well, it's because, because the mask, like the way the face is distorted. It's like human-ish in look with like the painted on smile and the eyes cut out and the little nose holes. Yeah. But just, um, it's disturbing. I think maybe I don't understand what uncanny valley. I thought uncanny valley was an, an inanimate object that looked unbelievably real. Uncanny uh, valley is a... Uh, something that's supposed to look human could yeah. be a doll could be a costume or whatever and it's this thing where like the closer it gets to actually looking human but when it still doesn't look human mm -hmm. the creepier it is and it's like uh, because of the way our brain processes our brain is like trying to think like i think that's human that's supposed to be human yeah but it's wrong and it, and it leaves you with like a lot of anxiety and like like but it can be a human no, a real human would never give you uncanny valley effect. But that's that was a person. That was a person dressed up mm -hmm. in a costume. But because of the mask on their face, that's oh, where it comes in. I was just thinking like, yes, a mask, but still it's like you're seeing the human eyes and the human. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I was just misunderstanding. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, what I see what you're saying. Yeah, I was just thinking, I'm like, but it is a person. <laughs> but not a normal looking person. Yeah, no, they just have like a painted on. Yeah, got it. Mm -hmm. I th for some reason, I thought like uncanny valley like really had to do with the eyes not being human. Nope. It's a, just a phenomenon of like mostly, mostly associated with dolls. Which is why I thought not human eyes. Okay. Because like, yeah, that's I, see, what, I, see, I see where you're coming from. That's what creeps me out about dolls yeah. is it's like when their eyes just look a little too intelligent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. La 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 <laughs> la. La la Who's uh, visiting you two? What Layla you got? Uh, I got the purple one. <gasps> it matches your shirt. Oh yeah. Perfect. Look how cute. I can't believe we didn't even take a Layla to the Dead & Co. How dare we? They're really upset. That's where I draw the line. I'm not going to be uh, uh, taking dolls out in the real world. Oh, that's where you that's where you draw the line. I, I love picturing Dan holding a Layla above his head, just like <laughs> eyes closed, <laughs> <laughs> just, like, just like there, just like uh huh. Yeah, I'm not going to take it quite that far. It, I love it. I'll take it that far. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let's dive in. How okay. you doing over there? Good. I'm good. I'm good. good. Yeah. All right. Okay, so this first story is about the people in the room. My story starts when I was about 12 or 13. My mother moved herself, my brother, my sister and I into my grandparents' old house after they moved into another house down the street, making my grandparents our landlords. After we had moved in and unpacked, I began, uh, I began to awaken in my dimly lit room by a strange noise constantly at 2 a.m. It sounded like someone or something was rustling around in my closet. This went on for quite a while and led to me insisting on having my closet doors closed at night. I do that. <laughs> on one occasion of being woken up by the sounds in my room, I awoke to see a group of people in Victorian clothing standing around my bed staring at me. One of the men leaned over said something to one of the other people, and then they all began walking through the wall next to my bed, 
one by one in a single line fashion until they had all left my room. The next morning, I told my mother about what had happened. Mom, I can't sleep in there. There's too many people in my room. And like all parents, she brushed it off with the typical, you just had a bad dream. From then on, I didn't tell anyone about the people in my room or all of the people I saw walking around our house at night. My friends would never sleep over more than once, all of them saying they didn't want to come back because they saw someone standing in the hallway watching them at night. One time, I had a girlfriend over while everyone else was out of town to watch a movie, (laughs) and she was walking from the restroom in the hallway past my room when I heard her scream. She came running into the living room crying and shaking. She said that as she walked past my room, she had heard someone calling her name. Valerie. She went into my room thinking it was me, but instead found some other guy standing there. (laughs) Needless to say, she never came over again after dark. Many years later, after I had moved out, I was visiting my mom in this house. My sister was also living there with my two nephews. My mom and I were in the kitchen talking late one night when my then five-year-old nephew stumbled sleepily into the kitchen and proclaimed, I can't sleep. There's too many people in my room. I jumped up and exclaimed, that's what I told you for years. He had been saying this every night for two weeks my mom shared with me. I felt so validated that maybe, after all, I wasn't so crazy. Uh, on that story, just where they had like um, the colonial figures, the first ones. Yeah. There's no mention of the other ones being colonial. Oh, yeah. It just made me think of some of these stories we've come across where for whatever reason, like this location, mm-hmm. things just get stuck there. Oh, yeah, like, like stuck in time? Uh-huh, because there was no, I mean, not that they couldn't have been the same, but there was no mention of, like, they're all seeing the same figure. True, true. And I would think that that girl that came over, um, if if she saw, like, a dude standing in his room uh-huh. that was wearing, like, old-timey colonial, th- like, that would be a detail you wouldn't leave out. True, 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 true. So I'm thinking that dude was dressed more like modern clothing. Oh, yeah, maybe. Who knows? Maybe. I was supposed to end that with a Hail Nimrod from, uh, from Jeremiah. Thanks, Jeremiah. All right. Want to hear about this possible attachment? Yes. Yeah, this is talk about where like mental health meets something else possibly. Hello, queen of the suck and suck master. (laughs) Here's the story of the demon that I believe haunted my mom's husband. In the summer after my freshman year of college, my mom married her boyfriend of two years. Their relationship was riddled with problems. And I was very worried about my mom and their new relationship. Her boyfriend had accused her many times of cheating. He would mentally abuse her by not talking to her for days, even though they lived together. And he even got mad at her. Uh, he even got mad at her for the three days that she had spent with her aunt, who was with my aunt, who was dying of cancer, as he deemed that my mom was spending too much time with her. The part that really concerned me, though, was that he never tried to be- build a relationship with my little brother, who was then three. Even after living with my mom for a year, he never attempted to make any sort of connection with my brother. Despite all of these problems, my hopeful mother with her beautiful heart hoped that saying I do would fix the mistrust and allow them to grow into each other. Never a good idea. We quickly found this wouldn't be the case. My mom's husband suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and anxiety. My mom tried for six months to get him to talk to someone, but he absolutely refused. It didn't matter what we did, he wouldn't let us help. And the abuse my mom endured only worsened. He began threatening to take his own life and tried multiple times, but my mom always stopped him before he could hurt himself. He was now using his life to mentally torture my mother. All these problems kept escalating and finally my mom had had enough and stood up for herself. She told him that she wouldn't be his punching bag anymore and all he responded with was a single text that said goodbye. About an hour later, my mom received a call from a customer, we own a remodeling home business, and the customer frantically told her that Mitch, her husband, had hung himself from a tree in their backyard. He was dead. My mom called me, obviously distraught. I grabbed my dog and we headed to my mom's house about an hour drive. I spent the day with my mom trying to help with all the kids and let her relax and take in everything that had happened. That night, I had to sleep with my mom in her bed because I no longer had a room in the house and am too tall to sleep on the couch. This meant I had to sleep on her husband's side of the bed. Creepy, but better than the floor. We went to bed and I quickly fell asleep as I was completely wiped out from the day. I immediately started to have this horrible nightmare. In the dream, I was lying in my mom's bed. She was asleep next to me and the TV was playing and the bathroom door was open. It was pitch black dark in the bathroom and I saw this dark shape start to take form. 
I could feel it get extremely cold, and then it stepped out of the bathroom and into the light of the TV. It was a very old, decrepit woman. She had something inhuman about her. She stared at me and was breathing heavily as she walked toward me slowly. I was so scared I couldn't move, and she began to whisper, He was mine. He was mine. He was mine over and over louder and louder until she was screaming it and now she was standing on top of me he was mine her face was only inches from mine i noticed that she was physically rotting and i could smell death on her she reached for me grabbed my wrist and pulled me with all her might toward the darkness of the bathroom when i woke up suddenly I was in a midway fall onto the floor from my mom's bed i had been physically pulled out of the bed i was in a cold sweat I looked up at the bathroom and I saw a shadow sink into the darkness. This was the only, this was not the only encounter, but the first with this thing. I told my mom the next day and she and I had come to the conclusion that whatever that thing was, it was attached to my mom's husband. After that night, we prayed over the house, but weird things continued to happen. Doors would slam suddenly on their own and pictures of my mom and her husband were found broken around the house. The day, the, fu- the day of the funeral had arrived. It was a hard and incredibly emotional day for our family as well as Mitch's. When we were graveside, about to bury him, we were all sitting down when an extremely cold breeze began blowing like crazy, which was super weird because it was May in Texas. It was a very warm and still day. They continued with the burial and once they had packed the dirt, the cold wind immediately stopped. We have never we have ha- never had any other experiences with this negative entity, thank God, though my mom does believe that her late husband still comes to visit her from time to time, or at least we hope it's him. Thanks for reading. Stay spoopy. Sincerely, Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. Were you so, making some notes over there? Yeah, so Mitch uh, is the late husband slash stepdad. Yeah. Right, and that's a... Uh, that's terrifying that there's like this entity, it sounds like in this story, that it seems to not only have pushed this person into taking their own life, but then after they're dead, still terrorizing the house uh-huh. and showing up at the funeral and stuff. It's like, wow, that that's different. Because usually I feel like when these entities like push or go after somebody that bad, like when it's, don't, maybe I'm mis- misremembering, but I think it usually kind of ends then. Oh, sorry. Like when that person dies, yeah, it's over. Of- yeah, I, or I guess maybe, or, or well, sometimes it's like I guess sometimes it stays it in the house. To, yeah. yeah, and it can it can like jump to another person. But then why? But then maybe the difference is also coming to the funeral, which is clearly uh, you know obviously outside of the I house. Know, isn't that weird? Or maybe it's not the entity at the house or at the funeral. Maybe, oh, maybe it was, that Mitch. was Mitch. Mitch's ghost or something. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Then I always wonder like what is the backstory there? I know. Like uh, totally random, maybe like totally random target. Or uh, did Mitch have some weird encounter that he just, you know, felt silly sharing or something? Mm. And then, and then like that, that led to that thing kind of uh, attaching itself to him? I don't know. Cause he was diagnosed, you know, with bipolar mm-hmm. and, you know, like very serious mental health issues. So it leads me back to your story where it's like, mm. did this entity prey upon this person who is already so vulnerable did he share some encounters that maybe people wrote off it's like well that's the mental illness you no know, talking right like yeah because i mean honestly if i okay <sighs> if you were in a depressive state mm-hmm. and you were like absolutely not yourself and and then and then it got worse and it spiraled into something else and the next thing you know we're seeing doctors and they're like mm-hmm. yeah he's manic depressive or has bipolar like something very serious very real very tangible and then Months later, what you know, whatever days, weeks, years later, mm-hmm. you you're telling me that you're seeing stuff. My immediate thought is like, oh, we've got a new mental health issue on our hands. Like now, now is now are we dealing with schizophrenia? Are we dealing with multiple yeah. personalities? Which I know is not the proper name for it anymore. But it's yeah, like disassociative identity. Yeah, it's uh, like uh, are other yeah. things happening? I'm not immediately jumping to the paranormal. So like this poor guy, like was he dealing with some very serious, very real stuff, and then there was paranormal elements to it that made it worse that's such a such, uh, such a scary you know possibility if totally it, 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 if, it, if it's real that you could be genuinely quote unquote losing your mind like like uh-huh. you're trying to get your medication figured out like regularly like you're dealing with some real chemical things going on in your brain and then you know that whole like kicking somebody when they're down yeah and you're already struggling with that and then some other thing that can't be cured by modern science and psychiatry like is also in the mix Mm -hmm. ah man it's like you've been cursed yeah and it's just like even 
I mean, I don't think that we always take mental health as seriously as we should, you know? So it's like, oh, they're just sad. It's like, oh, mm. you know? So it, people kind of like brush these things off often. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, okay, here comes Lindsay with another tall tale. It's like people aren't taking it yeah, seriously yeah. when you're like, I think there's something in her house. I think that has been done in horror movies, but it is, you know, I'm sure it will be done more because it is such a scary thing of like, you're seeing things because of mental illness, like mm -hmm. schizophrenia or something. You're having true like... um uh, you know, hallucinations. But then every once in a while, one of the hallucinations isn't a hallucination. Oh my God. And it actually is real. And you can't tell the difference between the hallucination or some scary fucking monster that actually is actively harming you. Do you think that there has been or will uh, be as psychedelics become more mainstream, do you think that there will be a horror movie that it's like some guy like you who <laughs> just really loves like a good psychedelic reset and then, but... If it hasn't been done already, I'm sure it'll be done. That, yeah, but then like you hallucinate something, but you're like, wait, what? I think those two little uh, creatures I saw, <laughs> I saw one night on, uh, what was it? I guess a combination of psilocybin and DMT. And... Um, it's always entertaining with Dan. <laughs> <laughs> but I think like... If those little creeps started showing up, like outside of that experience, just like like I just oh. I saw them again, you know, tomorrow or whatever. Oh, ah, that is we did have that this. is a we nightmare. We did this. We had a, a fan story where they indulged in some magic mushrooms and then saw like there was like a gnome, and then years later, oh yeah, I do. the the it was like the girl boyfriend and maybe boyfriend's brother, mm -hmm. and the the brother was like, did you just see that gnome? And it was like the same, but ultimately didn't think it was. I think ultimately like wasn't a bad necessarily a bad thing. Like maybe it was sort of like an omen of like because then I think she ended up breaking up with the boyfriend who ended up being a pos like stealing money yeah, from yeah, her yeah. for his coke habit. Well, yeah, and and you can have flashbacks. I mean you, that stuff like can like re-release in your system sometimes. Like if you um, crack your neck a few times. <laughs> I don't even remember actually where it stores. But but yeah, but then but then that would also like it's like, okay, was that a flashback or is that thing real? I like know. like um I don't know. I don't know. Hopefully it doesn't happen. I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think like it's it like if you're if you're dealing with mental health, like heavy stuff mm -hmm. and there's an element of paranormal, like what what again it's like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Probably the mental health stuff. But sure what if you didn't know that? What if you didn't have a diagnosed mental health issue and you were seeing something paranormal? And then you like, you're like telling somebody and they're like, oh my gosh. And, the, and then that leads you to therapy. And then the therapist is like, da, 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 da. you have bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, that's why I was seeing like, but then what if that thing is still there? And then you just like, you assume that it's part of your mental health. Problem. I know. What, oh if you, what if you got rid of like all the hallucinations? Like you're not having hallucinations anymore. You get on the proper medication, which wouldn't be bipolar. It would be like, you know, schizophrenia or something else, but you get rid of all of your hallucinations except for this one thing. Oh That's the gosh. worst. Where you're like, is that a hallucination? I mean, because if I was a psychiatrist or psychologist, I mean, I'm, I'm going to lean strongly towards, no, that's just still right. your brain chemistry. I'm not going to go down like the paranormal road. But then, so that nobody's going to believe you. Oh, I, just, I, I know. Just, what a terrible nightmare. Mm hmm oh, Okay. Anyways. One more? Yeah. Okay. Hello, queen and king of the suck. I'm writing to you today to tell you about an experience I had about 10 years ago that still haunts me to this day. I'm unsure of what came to me in my room all those years ago. I don't think it's a shadow person, but if it wasn't, then what was it? I'll let you pros be the judge. I live in a rural area in California. At the time, I worked at a five-star restaurant and always worked late. I was 19 and still living at home in the house I'd grown up in. I lived with my mom, stepdad, and a younger brother who were all fast asleep when I crept in the door. I tried to fall asleep around 2.30 a.m. with no success. I was wide awake. I put some headphones in and began to listen to some music. I had maybe been lying in bed for like 15 minutes listening to music when I felt someone crawling into bed with me from the foot of my bed. Now, my younger brother was a scaredy cat, so we always left the hall light on and my door stayed open because he would often crawl into bed with me. Thinking my little brother was getting into bed with me, I sat up to make room for him. I looked up only to find it wasn't my brother getting into bed. Instead, a very large and very black cloud was hovering over the foot of my bed, moving ever so slowly towards me. I closed my eyes for a moment, thinking my eyes were adjusting to the darkness. But when I opened them, the cloud was still there and still moving towards me. I immediately started screaming bloody murder and ironically ran into my brother's room next door. My screaming woke my parents who came out of their rooms asking what was going on. 
I explained what had happened, and of course, they told me it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. But I know what I saw. My mom is very religious and does not believe in the supernatural. She runs a daycare, and while I was away during the day, she would have the babies she watched nap in my room. A few weeks after my incident, she was moving one of the sleeping babies into my room after they had already fallen asleep. As she laid the baby down, she heard a strange little giggle. It did not come from one of the babies, and it wasn't sweet. It was rather more of an ominous sound. My mom didn't doubt me after that. We had my aunt, who practices with crystals, sage, and the like, come over to cleanse our house, and nothing has happened since her visit. I haven't done much research on what could have been, of what it could have been, but my aunt did tell me about spirits called vampires. They're not vampires in the way that we would generally think of them, but rather dark spirits that feed on negative energy. I had been going through a very rough breakup and was at my weakest point when this happened, and my aunt had no idea what I was going through, so it all made sense to me. Now to lighten up my story, my mom told me that when they heard they when they heard me screaming that night, she and my stepdad stopped at their door before opening it and looked at each other and almost didn't come out because they thought it might have been a murderer. <laughs> Gee, thanks guys. Love Space li- Lizard Amy. Thanks Amy. <laughs> I do love that. Like mm-hmm. just two parents like, I don't know, should we? Cuz like what if it's a murderer? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I wonder when they were talking about the the ominous giggle uh, not coming from one of the babies, but like from the area of the babies. Yeah, I immediately thought of Baby Secrets. Oh, where is Baby Secrets? In yeah. the in the other room. Oh man, Baby Secrets. I like is... to whisper in the dark. Yeah, she's so creepy. Mm-hmm. Do you guys know I Baby think, Whisper? If you don't look it up, it's a doll. And I think I, th- I think it's Baby Secrets. Yeah. Uh, you said Baby Whisper. Oh man, <laughs> that's. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, a different creepy toy. But Baby Secret, yeah, you can find old like commercials on YouTube. <laughs> I'm just imagining people Googling Baby Whispers. Like, what is she talking about? It's like, how nothing comes up. <laughs> no, it's like a rapper though. It's like a weird rap name, <laughs> Baby Whispers. Baby, but I think, uh, I think one of the, it's like a little pull string doll. And I think one of the sounds that comes out when you pull the string is a creepy giggle, I, I want to say. Probably. And then some words. Oh, and then um, you were asking, just to make it clear, so fans, you were asking for fans, like you, asked a question of the fans. What was the question about psychedelics and uh, and, and mental health? No, and- not psychedelics. I was just saying like mental health and like seeing stuff. Like, I don't know. I didn't write it down. So it was on, oh, off the okay. cuff. But just something like, you know, like how does that work? Like, what do you think? Do you think like the mental health diagnosis comes first? The vision, the paranormal comes first? If, if, the, if someone sees something paranormal, but then also is experiencing mental health issues, like how, do, how would you navigate that? Yeah, it's I'm such sure. like a confusing thing because I deal with anxiety and depression. Mm-hmm. I'm, like I'm medicated and all of those things and I'm in therapy constantly ab- about it and whatever, just like life. But like, I was just thinking about it from my own perspective of like, okay, when I'm in a really deep, dark depression, if I also started to see something paranormal, my immediate thought would be, holy shit, my mental health issues have escalated to a whole new place yeah but then that thing keeps showing up and then i would think like wait a second is it like think about what you do for a living you know what i mean like take (laughs) yourself out i don't know and like how would you navigate that i'm sure it's different for every uh situation yeah and where would you want people to um when we do ask questions on the show i was just thinking to remind people is it info at scared to death podcast.com it is dan okay just making sure thanks thanks for bringing it up yeah do you want to uh thank some annabelle's or you want me to oh i can go first sure okay I'd like to thank the following Annabelles for their support on Patreon and beyond. Jacqueline Hanna, Seven Holland, Kim Kelly, Zachary Irby, Cassidy Bowen, Nathan Brown, Samantha Mouchette, Christine Jorison, and B.B. Bex. B.B. Bex. B.B. Bex. I'm still thinking about one of the names from last week that I uh, <laughs> can't believe a week a week later oh. just flew over my head. Sir Vix. Masher. Uh-huh. Did not connect it. Oh, no. oh, man, we were laughing but about that job. so hard after the recording. Uh, I would like to thank the following Annabelles. Justin Stewart, Meg Ibsen, Sabrina Randall, Ashley Kidd, Anthony Bailey, Tyler and Holly Olson, Mari. Hey, hey, hey. It's Matt Albert. That's, I mean, That's pretty funny, Fat hey, Albert. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, and then Zach Robbins and Kelsey Kostriva. Kostriva. Good job. Yeah. All right. All right. And then I have my spoopy, spoopy shout outs to Edward from Elsa. Happy sixth anniversary to Marcia from your brother, Micah. Happy birthday to Abriana from your mom and dad. Also happy birthday to Ella from your mom, Alana. Happy 10th birthday to my spooky daughter. I hope you have the most amazing birthday. I love you so much. 
And to Henry from your wife, Sharon, and all of us here at Scared to Death, we know life has really thrown you for a loop. We are so proud of you for keeping your head up and working hard to find this new version of your life. Henry, you and I talked about this off air. Henry was paralyzed in an accident uh, last September. And it's just so crazy. Just like Dan and I have been, you know, we all have these moments of like gratitude in our lives and just like we all take for granted the ability to just like get up and go to the bathroom in the morning and just like move throughout our lives and our days. And sometimes that changes in an instant through no fault of your own. And it's crazy. I don't know how you guys are doing it, but I don't know. You and your wife sound like pretty awesome people. They have a couple kids that have their own challenges and just sounds like as a family, they've just like pulled together and like, okay, we're going to do this now. I know st stories like that or when I meet people like that, <laughs> It always, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm such a piece of shit. When I, yes. when, when I think about like what I get frustrated with or what can like, what, what I will allow to ruin my day and it mm -hmm. really is allow, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just like, my brain will just stay there. And then later I'm like, what was I? Oh, because I, I don't know. Um, there was some episode I got negative feedback like like the most trivial thing I think in about, the grand scheme of life I'm just starting to try like these little things like I'm annoyed that the person in front of me didn't go and the light turned green immediately right, how right. dare you and it's like oh my, my, my car is going to be in the shop for an extra day it's like but yet I live in a household with like there's another V it's like it's nothing it's nothing it's, a, it's the most minor inconvenience where I'm like ugh, mm, ugh, mm, ugh. poor me my life's so hard yep and, and meanwhile there is some you know dealing with a lot more things you know, physically or, or, or mentally or financially yeah. or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. who are also like, you know what? I'm happy to be alive. Yep. I'm happy to be playing the game, happy to be here, going to enjoy every minute. Uh, I th yeah. thank, thank God for those people being in the world. Like, I, 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 hope, I, hope, I hope a lot of those people, I hope all of those people understand how much positivity they bring just yeah. by being who they are to so many other people. I know the power of positivity and positive thinking. So contagious. It is so contagious, as is as is negativity. I know. It can go either way. I know. Like you gotta choose. Yep. You gotta you gotta surround yourself with a high vibe tribe. Oh, that's so true. So true. I'm I'm learning that more later in life. Like be really careful who you allow into your circle. Yeah, we can right? talk about that on the yeah. on the bonus episode this month. Also, look at how great my summer camp blanket is. You guys. Look how cute it is. I'm gonna wear that's a really whole, cute. I'm gonna wear a whole summer camp outfit on the bonus episode this month so get ready for it <laughs> uh, that's our show thanks for the uh, ratings and reviews lately creeps and peepers they really do help us find new listeners Spotify Apple wherever you choose to leave those ratings and reviews it uh, it keeps us current you know it keeps kind of like a Yelp review and it does help us find uh, new listeners and continues to do so so we are so appreciative yes thank you so much thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror which adds so much to the show as well to my story at scared to death podcast.com you can email us for everything else info at scared to death podcast.com Com. Thanks to Logan Keith, Tyler C for the work on social media and to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Thanks to Logan Keith for producing and directing today, Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails and to our book editor, Drew Atana for work on the now released book number four. Thanks to producer Sophie Evans for finding the first tale I told today and Sarah Finch for finding the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you'd like to watch the show. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. If you want more content, see pics that accompany the show. I thought the AI one was horrifying. And that's Scared to Death Podcast. I love that it just didn't bother me. I was like, okay. I know, but then the other one bothered you so much more. And I thought that one was like, yeah, scary, but not as scary. It's funny what hits us all differently. Yeah. I just uh, thought the first one was more like artistic. Mm, yeah. Uh, we have a private Facebook group, Creeps, Creeps and Peepers. So many horror lovers in there to meet. And you can follow us on TikTok at Scared to Death Podcast for show highlights and more. And if you don't want to hear any ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes and more, check out our Patreon and enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. Picturing Dan holding a Layla above his head, just like <laughs> eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to take it quite that far. It, I love it.